Namaste. Well, the comments I've been getting and private messages also uh, are steering me towards emphasizing the uh, importance of the ordinary sadhana and devotional service, that is, karma yoga and bhakti yoga. In the beginning stages of spiritual life. Uh, the reason for this, in a nutshell, is that it generates tons of good karma. But it also gives you a background of experience in dealing with God, even in duality. Uh, this experience is extremely valuable and important as a foundation for meditation and self-realization in the higher stages. If you try to skip it, you will fall down. I've seen it a million times, I'm telling you. Okay, let's go back to my very early days of being a disciple of my Adi Guru. He had quite an extensive foundation uh, organization worldwide with over a hundred temples, you know, all over the planet. And I was one of his early disciples, and I was fortunate to be introduced to him by an intimate childhood friend from Calcutta. That was my music teacher, Ali Akbar Khan. So Prabhupada always treated me like, you know, a friend of the family, kind of, if you know what I mean. If you've been to India, you know that there are all these different types of relationships, and uh, they're called village relationships. In other words, someone outside your family who is connected with your family in a certain way, either through living in the same village or through some distant family relationship, or, you know, combination of the above, or working together, or believing in the same cause, or whatever it is, they have a more intimate relationship than any outsider, you know, recruited from hoi polloi, the, the mob, the ordinary crowd, huh? uh, because they come through a trusted friend. So from the beginning, Prabhupada, you know, uh, Prabhupada, uh, his first job right out of college. In fact, I think he left college early. He left university early to take this job with the Bose family. Yeah, the same people that make the loudspeakers. Huh? But they also have a very strong political side. And uh, Bose and Bosley are the two families very famous in India uh, during the separation from the British. Uh, they played crucial roles, and they're also very wealthy. Uh, so Prabhupada was on the edge of that circle. He was, you know, a trusted outsider in that circle. And as a result, right out of school, or I think they, they recruited him before he even graduated, as the manager of their big production facility in Calcutta. And of course, everybody asked, well, why did you pick this guy, this young guy, you know, this is none, no experience or nothing? And he said, I trust him. How did you trust him? Through family connection, through the extended network. This is how things work in India. <laughs> it's just the way it is, okay? So, in the same way, my music teacher, Kansab, introduced me to Prabhupada. And from that point on, I had pretty much free run of the temples because he trained me up, first as a cook and then as a kirtan leader. So I was there right in the beginning, and I saw, especially around the time of Prabhupada's disappearance, what happened amongst the God brothers, amongst the disciples, and how they were uh, literally 
ready to kill to secure a leadership position in the society, you know, going forward after Prabhupada's disappearance. And they had been strategizing towards this for years because it was obvious that he was about to leave his body. And I got to see firsthand because I was the secretary. I was taking notes in the meetings. Why? Because they trusted me to keep my mouth shut, among other things. And because I never argued with them. You know, uh, I felt sometimes like Vidura in the councils of, of Dhritarashtra and Duryodhana. But it was not my place to criticize because I was completely dependent upon them uh, for the maintenance of my sadhana. See? So I just ser served my spiritual master as best I could, but I got a ringside seat at the championship fights. Let me tell you, I saw the kind of cutthroat, backstabbing politics, competition that goes on. You know, you don't have to tell me what's going on inside the Democratic and Republican parties right now. <laughs> I know. I've been there. When the pie suddenly shrinks, there are very, very strong competitors for the remaining positions. It's like musical chairs. You know that game, musical chairs? If there's 10 people playing, they have nine chairs. And the music goes and everybody goes around and around. But when the music stops... You got to get your butt in a chair or you're out. And then after that, they remove one of the chairs and there's only eight chairs <laughs> and so on down to the last chair. And that one becomes the winner. So it's the same way in politics. It's like the last one left standing after duking it out. It's nasty. It's ugly. It's mean. But you have to understand Every leader in a big organization has gone through that and beat the other guys. That's how he got to this position. Uh, that's, that's why he has the power over this big organization, whatever it is. And, you know, I have to say it. It's, it's hard to say, but it's the truth that every leader of every organization I've ever been a part of, and I mean everyone, both secular and spiritual, displayed strong uh, antisocial qualities. You know, what do we call that these days? A narcissist? <laughs> Sociopath, whatever. Um, even my Adi Guru, I have to say, and that's okay, uh, because if he had the antisocial uh, qualities of uh, being a brutal competitor, which he certainly was, uh, one time he said, I established this organization to uh, silence my god brothers to defeat my god brothers. I wrote it, my books. I did everything I did. It was to defeat my god brothers. Now, he did it outside his guru's organization. But my god brothers did it inside. They didn't go out and start their own thing. Huh? I did, but much later. That's another story. The point is... Any organization, I don't care if it's the local PTA huh? or the garden club or the knitting club or whatever people do at their time, they all have this kind of inside competition for a position, leadership. So, and especially if you've seen our video on the Gervais principle, um, the leaders are almost always sociopathic. Yes, even someone who has 
I would say, uh, first path, enlightenment, still has antisocial and sociopathic tendencies. If they have any interest in leadership, in establishing or maintaining or expanding a big organization. Huh? This is one of the reasons why I specifically uh, cut that out. Like, it's not a possibility. If somebody showed up with a million-dollar check tomorrow, uh, if it was no strings, I might accept it. But if it was on the condition of establishing an organization, you know, uh, no thanks. <laughs> I'm okay. <laughs> Om Namah Shivaya. That I don't want to be in a leadership position. And I don't want to have a hand in establishing something for which there could be that kind of competition that kind of nastiness, that kind of meanness. Because being in a leadership position, I know, huh? I had, like I said, I started my own thing later on. And I found out that to maintain my position as the leader, I would have had to compete with and defeat my students. And I was unwilling to do that. I tried it once or twice, and it felt so bad, I just, you know, couldn't do it. So I destroyed the thing instead. Huh? Like Lao Tzu, or was no, Rumi says, destroy your reputation. Huh? Become useless. That's what the Chinese Lao Tzu says. Become useless, or is that Huang Tzu? Anyway. Become useless and nobody will try to exploit you. Nobody will try to hook you into some relationship where you can then compete for who's going to be the leader. You know, it's happened in every single relationship I've ever had that there's always this competition of who's going to be in charge. That's not love. So I couldn't go there. I can't go there. I won't go there. And so I don't go there. I live as a hermit. And that's fine. Because that means my all relationships, my all love, my all activities and everything is in devotion to God. And that's what brings about the spontaneous revelation of the personalized, confidential form of God within. And this is the ultimate deity of bhakti. This is that being to whom we can give our love completely because we experience directly that his love and devotion for us is unconditional and endless, just endless, just bottomless. So given that, we can trust him fully like no one else because, you know, he's already God. There's no competition. It's already done. It's finished, huh? Yeah, I mean, you know, we can test him, and, and we will, we do. But that's the nature of any relationship. The answer always comes out the same. God is God, and we are the devotees. And if we value our sanity, we base our life on service to God and love of God. And everything else has to fall in line with that. That's the key to being happy in this world and in this life and ultimately to attain the complete enlightenment. Aum Tat Sat. Aum Shakti Aum. Aum Namah Shivaya. <laughs>